Office Clearinghouse webinar. Today's presentation by Commander Paul Nelson with the Aurora, Illinois Police Department will shed light on how agencies can use data to decide what works well, what doesn't, and how our approaches should evolve to improve the effectiveness of our responses to an active shooter or active assailant event. Your instructor, as I mentioned, is Commander Paul Nelson, who is a 27-year veteran of the Aurora, Illinois Police Department. During his career, he has served as a patrol officer, field training officer, investigator, special response team member, patrol sergeant, planning and research lieutenant, Office of Professional Standards Lieutenant, Investigations Lieutenant, and is currently the Support Services Bureau Commander. On the next slide, and before we begin, I want to share with you some information about the Justice Clearinghouse, one of the key reasons why we're all here today. The Justice Clearinghouse is a peer-to-peer -peer educational program for justice professionals. We ask that if you are not presently a member of the Justice Clearinghouse, that you consider joining after today's webinar and support our work. We typically host webinars on a weekly basis on topics related um, on all aspects of justice for justice professionals. On the next slide, the last thing I want to address with everyone is some basic housekeeping items. First, this event is being recorded and is scheduled to last between 45 and 60 minutes. And second, this is a listen-only event, but you can type in any questions you have through the webinar tool, and we'll address as many questions as possible at the conclusion of today's presentation. So thank you again for attending, and let's go ahead and get started. Commander Nelson, it's all yours. Thank you, Heather, and uh, welcome, everyone, and good morning or afternoon, depending on where you happen to be situated in the country. Uh, first of all, before we uh, really get into the subject matter, I want to uh, say uh, who I am, and, and mostly what I mean by that is who I'm not. Uh, I'm from the Aurora, Illinois Police Department, not Aurora, Colorado. And Aurora, Colorado, of course, is where they had the, the tragic theater shooting uh, incident a, a couple years back. Um, we in Aurora, Illinois, got inundated with uh, media inquiries after that because uh, people thought that uh, we were them. And uh, I certainly hope that uh, nobody signed up for this webinar thinking that I'm from Aurora, Colorado, or that this is a debrief of the Aurora Theater shootings. Uh, number two, I want everyone to understand up front that uh, I've never been involved in a live active assailant incident, but I have worked heavily in training and preparing for them uh, for about the last 18 years. We actually started work on developing uh, new tactics to deal with the threat two years before Columbine happened. Um, outside of one Christmas Day incident several years ago that was confined to one family in their house, uh, we in Aurora have never had an active assailant situation. So this presentation is based uh, solely on my analysis of incidents in other jurisdictions, my thoughts, and my background training and experiences. Um, I'm a cop of uh, almost 28 years. Uh, I'm a former combat arms uh, military officer in the Army Reserve, and I also have a SWAT background but I have no, for, no formal training beyond that. I'm not a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a sociologist, uh, and the material in this presentation are uh, just my thoughts and my opinions. So before we begin talking about what the police response should be, let's uh, first take a quick look at the types of assailants that we're likely to encounter and understand which of these we really mean when we talk about active assailants. Sorry, double tap the mouse there. First is the mentally deranged person, and that's exactly what they are. Uh, they have no intended target in terms of being after a specific person or group of people for a specific reason. They have no connection to the location of the assault. They're just as likely to walk into a McDonald's and start shooting as they are a school. Uh, they're still highly dangerous and must be treated as the mass murderer would be, but the reason for their attack is different. Depending on their level of derangement, their actions tend to be more spontaneous without a lot of planning going into their assault. The second is the targeted assailant, and they're usually after one specific person. In schools, historically, it's been the kid that bullied him, the girl that dumped him, or the teacher or principal that angered him. In other contexts, like is, uh, in terms of workplace shootings, the targets have been a spouse or a girlfriend or boyfriend. Once they carry out their attack against that targeted person, they either kill themselves or calmly wait for the police to arrive and take them into custody. While we can never say that an armed assailant in the building isn't a threat to anyone else, these people really intend no harm to anyone besides their target and maybe themselves. Of course, we don't have the luxury of knowing their intention in advance, and our response will be the same. 
And then the third type is the mass murderer. While all assailants are dangerous, uh, these are the very dangerous ones. These are the ones who are in it for the body count to try and get the record. They spend a long time in planning and preparing for the assault, and they have no expectation of surviving it. These are the ones that we usually think of when we talk about active assailants. So let's talk now about uh, response times. Um, first of all, the lesson we all learned as the law enforcement community after Columbine was we realized that we couldn't continue with the traditional tactic of securing perimeters and waiting for SWAT to arrive. We realized that only patrol officers could get to the scene of a mass shooting quickly enough to positively impact the outcome, so we started training our patrol officers in rapid response and rapid deployment tactics and the result was our patrol officers get there much more quickly uh, than our SWAT teams used to. Um, but what we've learned now is with the advent of rapid response tactics, uh, we've cut our responses to under two minutes, in some cases just a little over one minute, and yet we still can't get there fast enough to prevent mass casualties. So what we've learned is that no law enforcement response will ever be quick enough to prevent or seriously limit large number of casualties. They may prevent um, you know, someone who might have killed uh, 40 people uh, from doing that and only killing 30. But can anybody consider, uh, you know, 30 dead people really being a success? Uh, only the people uh, who are in the potential victim pool will ever be in a position to do that. Uh, but very few people, police officials, school officials, politicians, et cetera, are willing to acknowledge that lesson and pursue it to its logical conclusion. So we still have the need for the fastest possible police response, even though we know that we're not going to be able to get there quickly enough to prevent uh, mass casualties. What we need to make sure is that our own policies aren't slowing our response. In the aftermath of Columbine and other incidents, uh, NIMS, the National Incident Management System, has been presented as the model for handling multi-agency mass casualty events. But we need to look critically at NIMS, what it's good for and what it's not good for. NIMS is great for managing the aftermath of an incident, coordinating the transportation of victims to treatment, coordinating mutual aid, coordinating the media, planning and executing clearing operations, planning for food and water, etc. But when the situation is still active, when the assailant is at large and victims are being harmed, trying to establish NIMS will be a hindrance. So what we need to do then is stand up a counter model uh, to NIMS and incident command for when the assailant is still active. And what I pro propose for this is a concept called the immediate action drill. And this is a concept that comes out of the Army. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, all branches of the military. The Army is what I'm familiar with. What the immediate action drill uh, is this. Uh, we used to train so that whatever we might encounter, say if you happen to be out uh, you know, on a, an infantry patrol, whatever we might encounter, we had a pre-planned, pre-trained immediate action response for. So if we were hit by a sniper, if we took incoming artillery fire, um, if we took a, a tactical airstrike, if we walked into a minefield, if we happened to walk into uh, you know, one of a variety of types of ambushes, we had immediate action drills for all of those things. And the idea was the leader would call out what the drill was. He might call out a, a direction and a, a distance for movement, and the immediate action drill would be immediately put into place as the quickest way of getting you out of harm. In law enforcement, uh, we have to acknowledge that we generally are always going to enter the battle space individually, uh, not as part of a team and uh, without uh, you know, an immediate command structure with us. In the military, it's the opposite. You always enter the battle space as part of an established team and with a command structure already established and present, and yet they still recognize the need for pre-planned responses, immediate action drills. So if the military recognizes the need for immediate action drills, when they already have established teams and a command structure in place, how much more do we need it in law enforcement with none of those things in place? The immediate action drill will allow much, much faster responses than can be obtained by trying to establish leadership and engage in coordination and planning while the assailant is still active. For example, if your first person on scene is a sergeant, should he attempt to locate and engage the assailant or start est establishing a command post? Every training exercise I've ever been to runs into this problem where they uh, struggle with um, you know, when the command post should be established um, and, and, and who should establish it. So what if your uh, first supervisor is the uh, second person on the scene or the third? Uh, should they engage the assailant or should they start trying to establish a command post? What if that first person on the scene happens to be a lieutenant? 
I think the simple answer is that until the assailant is at a minimum isolated and contained, and you'll hear that theme throughout this presentation, all personnel on scene should be actively engaged in the hunt for the assailant. This can be accomplished because the officers don't need direct command to tell them what they need to be doing. They already know what they need to do because it was instructed and trained in advance as an immediate action drill. Their direction's already been given. Now they just have to execute that plan. So while the attempt to put NIMS or incident command in place while the hunt for the assailant is still active can slow down our response, it's indispensable in the following stages of an incident. It's not a question of whether or not NIMS should be used, but rather a question of when its implementation is most appropriate. So then what should the police response be? Uh, first, we want to respond as quickly as we can with as much as we can. Immediately get SWAT en route, institute call diversion, and activate mutual aid. Uh, your SWAT team and probably mutual aid too won't get there in time to isolate and contain the assailant, but you're going to need them eventually and it takes a while for them to respond, so get them coming right away. On-duty officers who happen to be cross-trained as SWAT will respond to the scene immediately as part of the patrol response, not as part of SWAT. But we're not going to wait for SWAT or mutual aid to arrive before taking action. We're making immediate entries and going directly after the assailant. So we can forget about trying to establish perimeters, trying to establish a command post, and trying to organize teams uh, when the assailant is still active. All arriving officers need to immediately enter the hot zone, and we'll talk more about the definition of the hot zone in a little bit, locate and engage the assailant, and eliminate the threat based on the previously trained immediate action drills. And we've come up with a couple of acronyms that we use here in Aurora um, for that response. Uh, initially, we came up with ICE. Uh, for indoor assailants. We refer to it as, uh, you know, we're going to ice the bad guy. That was a nice little mnemonic where everybody could remember, um, you know, what their action should be. And then uh, we further developed that for outdoor assailants that we call the three Fs. So first of all, let's define terms. Isolate means the assailant no longer has access to victims. Contain means the assailant no longer has the freedom to maneuver. And eliminate means the assailant is no longer a threat. <coughs> Excuse me. That elimination phase can take one of three forms, either the capture of the assailant, the surrender of the assailant, or the death of the assailant. By definition, when you have both isolation and containment of the assailant, you have a barricaded subject. Accordingly, there's no longer a need to continue with active assailant response tactics. At this point, containment of the assailant would continue while your SWAT team responds. And then when they arrive on the scene with their specialized training and equipment, the threat posed by the assailant is reduced in the safest manner possible. With no ongoing threat to innocent lives, which again is what you have by definition when you have both isolation and containment, there's no longer a, a reason to needlessly risk our lives. And then for outdoor assailants, uh, we slightly modify that uh, to the three Fs, uh, and that's just to tailor the terminology a little more to outdoor circumstances. And those three Fs are find uh, or locate the assailant, fix him in his location, which means you take away his uh, freedom to maneuver, again, very similar, similar to isolate and contain. And then the third F is you finish him as a threat, and that'll have the same possible outcomes as the elimination phase of ICE. So the three Fs, find, fix, and finish. Our response tactics need to be in alignment with the priorities of life that I think all law enforcement agencies philosophically agree with, but which our tactics don't always align with. And those priorities of life are innocent first, us second, and the offenders last. In order to adhere to the priorities of life, we must move through the building as rapidly as possible to locate the assailant and then isolate and contain him. Uh, the traditional rapid response tactic taught uh, that your contact teams are composed of uh, four or five officers uh, that walk in a diamond formation. Walking in a four or a five officer formation with people you've probably never practiced this movement with before, you may have practiced it, but uh, the people that you're actually on that contact team with may be people you've never done it with before while executing unfamiliar movement techniques upon encountering intersecting hallways or open doorways while one of you is facing backwards is inevitably going to slow you down. If the assailant wants to avoid or break contact with you, you will never catch him using this formation. The justification for using this formation was to pro provide 360 degree security in a dynamic situation, but that necessarily means that we're violating the life safety priorities by putting our safety ahead of innocence and it really never provided security against all possible threat angles anyways. When you're walking down a hallway with numerous doors uh, and intersecting hallways on both sides, 
you could have 10 officer teams and be barely able to cover all your threat points. What we need to do is restructure our tactical response to best enable us to quickly find, isolate, and contain the threat. So instead of a four officer team, if we decide to work in two officer teams, that allows us to move much faster through the building. Working with a single partner is something that we're all familiar with, so it builds on, uh, on something we're used to doing, not on something that we're very unfamiliar with. Um, every time we conduct a building search pursuant to an alarm, we do it with a single partner. So let's build on those things that, uh, that are comfortable to us and, and that uh, you know, we're used to doing rather than the things that are very strange to us. Now, while our preference would be to make entries as part of a two-officer team, solo sh entry should be made when backup is not immediately available. And when I say immediately, I mean immediately. If I pull up on the scene and I'm out of my squad car and I'm making my way to my entry point and uh, my backup is just pulling in the parking lot, I'll, I'll wait those few seconds for him to uh, get out of his car, run up and meet me, and we'll both enter together. On the other hand, if I'm pulling up uh, on the scene, uh, I'm getting out of my car and making my, my way to the door, and uh, I hear on the radio that my closest backup is still a few blocks away, I'm not waiting for him. I'm going in by myself. Um, and it doesn't matter what the odds are. Uh, I'm going in by myself because I'm the only one uh, in that school that's going to be armed. I'm the only one that's going to be trained to fight. And I'm the only one that's going to have a chance to uh, reduce that threat as quickly as possible. So I'm not waiting for anybody. I'm going in by myself. Two officer teams allow us to occupy twice as much space during the search for the assailant with the same amount of on-scene resources than does a four officer team, thereby increasing the chances of finding the assailant more quickly and isolating and containing him. In summary, the, uh, the two officer team is quicker, more nimble, more familiar, allows for more coverage, and is in keeping with our priorities of life. Another thing that we want to uh, keep in mind as we're moving through the building on the hunt for the assailant is that no victims will be rescued or treated until all known assailants are at a minimum isolated and contained or found or fixed in outdoor scenarios, and that includes fellow police officers. And the simple fact is that the assailant can create casualties far faster than we can evacuate them, and any manpower that we waste on treating the evacuate, or I'm sorry, treating or evacuating the wounded will only result in delays in stopping the assault and consequently more casualties. We're there to limit the casualty count, not to inadvertently add to it by our chosen tactics. Rushing into a gunfight is something not everyone can do, and that includes cops and soldiers. If we allow officers to have the option of doing something seen as being equally heroic, such as evacuating casualties and saving lives, while not having to actively engage in the search for armed assailants, some will avail them, themselves of that opportunity, and consequently more lives will be lost. We have to not allow that as an option while the assailant is still active so that all on-scene personnel are actively hunting for the assailant. Another thing that we want to change is traditionally in policing we've been taught to treat everyone we encounter as a potential suspect until we can prove otherwise. But do the math on that one. Every one of our four major public high schools in Aurora has a daytime population of about 3,000 students and staff and then we have additional private high schools that are in the high hundreds to low thousands. Between those who are self-evacuating, uh, those that we're evacuating, and those we'll encounter in the building while hunting for the assailant, if we treat every single one of them as a potential suspect, one thing I can guarantee is that we'll never find the real assailant until it's too late. So what we need to do is trust our instincts and observations and be confident that we'll be able to quickly distinguish fleeing panicked innocents from the cold-blooded mass murderer and bypass the former as we aggressively seek out the latter. We need to use what history teaches us to help us formulate our plans, and this is what history teaches us. There is seldom more than one assailant, which is why during this presentation I refer to him in the singular. When there has been more than one assailant, there's never been more than two. And when there has been two, they've tended to stay together, so they are effectively one, which means when you find one of them, you've more than likely found both of them. Acknowledging this fact allows us to greatly speed up our search without being slowed down by thinking that the boogeyman is around every corner. In many active assailant situations, the fog of war has led us to think that there are other accomplices at large, but after many hours of searching, it almost always turns out that the one who was initially located and eliminated was the only one. We have to acknowledge that history and start planning on that as being the expected norm. So now let's talk about the difference between indoor versus outdoor active assailants. Uh, traditionally, uh, most training has been centered around uh, the school shooting, the indoor active assailant. 
But we have to start thinking about uh, what happens when they happen outdoors. Even in an indoor incident, it may start or finish outdoors. With the growing threat of Islamic extremism throughout the world and their calls for attacks in the U.S., we also have to start thinking about and preparing for Mumbai-style attacks uh, or on a slightly smaller scale, attacks like uh, the uh, Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris, which it looks like could have been very easily mimicked down in uh, Texas a couple of days ago. We need to start thinking about and preparing for those types of attacks here at home. We have to understand that there are significant differences between the tactics we would employ indoors versus outdoors and recognize that failing to, to use the appropriate tactics can be very counterproductive. So let's talk about the characteristics of indoor situations. This is what you'll typically run into. You have controlled access points. You have very limited sight lines. You have very limited room for maneuver. There's the likelihood that you'll first observe the offender when you run up on him. And because of these factors, we've traditionally trained not to seek cover, but rather upon contact with the assailant to close the distance while engaging him until he's eliminated as a threat. In outdoor situations or very large indoor situations, like maybe an enclosed mall or a very large warehouse, those circumstances are exactly reversed. Your access to the battle space is wide open. Your sight lines are very long and allow for greatly increased engagement distances. There is significant room for maneuver, and it's much easier to locate the offender at a distance. So because of these considerable differences between indoor versus outdoor operations, when operating outdoors, we should train to, uh, number one, use rifles. Sorry, I got too far ahead of myself there. So the immutable laws of small arms combat are this. A shotgun beats a pistol, and a rifle beats a shotgun nearly every time. If the assailant has a rifle and you have a pistol, there's a very good chance you're not going home at the end of that day. If you have a rifle, on the other hand, and use proper tactics and the assailant has a pistol, it's hard for you to lose. And if you have multiple rifles and use the proper tactics, you can't lose. What it boils down to is this simple fact. Whoever brings the most rifles wins. Um, now, I said nearly every situation, and I'm very happy to say that the events down in Texas two days ago uh, proved to be the exception to this. In that case, you had two subjects armed with rifles. Uh, that were engaged by one cop with a pistol. And uh, not only was he nor anybody else hit by the guys with rifles, he managed to take both of them out with pistols um, and, and good. But understand that uh, that is the exception to the rule. That's not the norm. Uh, usually the rifles are going to win. And, in fact, what happened in that case, it appears that the, uh, the two assailants, uh, would-be assailants that were armed with the rifles, uh, really had no understanding how to utilize those rifles. And if they had utilized the things I'll talk about next, I think the outcome would have been much different. So one thing to keep in mind uh, with rifles is the standoff advantage of rifles. And uh, here's what I mean by the sta standoff advantage. Uh, in the military, um, a, a military sniper uh, does his absolute best to never engage an enemy target below 800 meters. Now, that's... Uh, been different in urban situations like, uh, you know, we saw in Iraq where you just uh, don't have those kinds of long distances all the time. But in, uh, in open terrain situations, uh, they never engage by choice uh, an enemy under 800 meters. And the reason for that is the maximum effective range of all assault weapons currently on the battlefield is 600 meters. So what that does is that builds a 200-meter buffer zone. You know, if you have a, a bolt-action sniper rifle that, you know, maybe uh, holds five rounds, why would you want to engage somebody that has a weapon that has a select fire capability and has a 20 or 30 round detachable box magazine within his effective range where he can hit you? You would never want to do that because you would put yourself uh, at a disadvantage. Uh, rather, what you want to do is uh, maintain that buffer so that you can reach out and touch him at ranges where he can't hit you. Uh, and that's why military snipers won't engage uh, troops below uh, 800 meters, uh, at least by choice they won't. We need to take that exact same concept and apply that to police work. We want to engage the assailant at distances in which he cannot effectively engage you. And when we have rifles and they have pistols, that's exactly what we can do. The other thing that we want to understand is the terminal ballistic advantage of rifles. And uh, briefly, there's three types of ballistics. There's what's called internal ballistics, which deals with the performance characteristics of the bullet from the uh, moment of detonation of the round of ammunition until the bullet exits the muzzle of the weapon. Then there's external ballistics, which deals with the flight characteristics of the bullet from the time it leaves the muzzle up until the time it hits the target. And then there's terminal ballistics, which deals with the uh, flight characteristics, trajectory, I guess, uh, for want of a better term, 
of the bullet once it actually strikes uh, its target, which uh, for us it means tissue. Now, I don't want to go into too much depth on terminal ballistics because that's a webinar subject for another day, but keep these things in mind. There is a 2,000 foot uh, per second threshold uh, that is going to dictate uh, the, the wounding effect of the permanent wound channel and the temporary wound channel. Every bullet creates two wound channels. The permanent one is the path of destruction uh, that the bullet actually creates as it tears uh, through tissue. Um, that's what the bullet touches. The temporary wound channel is a wound channel that's caused by the hydrostatic shock effect of the bullet as it passes through tissue, which is comprised mostly of water. So here's where the 2,000 foot per second threshold is important. Below 2,000 uh, feet per second, uh, that hydrostatic shock effect in the temporary wound channel uh, does not do any permanent damage to tissue. Above 2,000 feet per second, uh, it does uh, cause uh, damage to tissue. Uh, outside of oddball, like wildcat calibers, or maybe someone that took a, an actual rifle round and built a pistol around it. When I talk about pistol bullets, I'm talking about the traditionally available pistol bullets, and certainly the pistol bullets that we all in law enforcement carry. There is no pistol bullet around uh, that comes anywhere close to that 2,000 foot per second threshold. On the other hand, just about every single rifle bullet around exceeds that 2,000 foot per second threshold. So what that means is a pistol bullet can only damage tissue that it touches, whereas a rifle bullet uh, can damage tissue in the temporary wound channel. It can damage tissue uh, far away uh, from uh, what it actually touches. And that gives you not only a huge uh, standoff advantage of rifles over pistols, it also gives you a huge terminal ballistic impact of rifles uh, over bullets. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, rifle bullets over pistol bullets. The third thing to keep in mind is the effect of rifles on body armor. Um, most uh, wearable body armor, concealable body armor, uh, is either in the, uh, the class two to the class three A range, which will stop uh, most handgun rounds. On the other hand, it won't stop any rifle rounds. You have to get up into class three or class four uh, armor in order to defeat rifle rounds. So when you have a rifle, uh, even if your opponent is armed with soft body armor, your rifle is going to cut right through it. Think back to the North Hollywood bank robbery many years ago in the Los Angeles area. Uh, both of those subjects were armed with rifles and they had soft body armor on. Um, the, the one subject who ended up uh, killing himself when he ran out of ammunition was hit multiple times with pistol bullets. And you could see the bullets, uh, you know, hitting him. You could see, uh, you know, a little movement on his body uh, as he was being struck. But none of them were penetrating. And he kept firing until he eventually ran out of ammunition and then killed himself. If those officers uh, who were engaging him had rifles, he would have been put down much sooner than he was because his body armor would have been no protection. And again, with that North Hollywood example, um, it wasn't until uh, the cops arrived with rifles that the tide of that battle really started to change. When it was only the bad guys that had the rifles, they were inflicting a lot of casualties. Fortunately, nobody outside of the two of them died, which is still, in my mind, a minor miracle. Uh, but it wasn't until the cops arrived, arrived with the rifles that the, uh, the tide really turned and, uh, you know, the last of the bad guys was put down. We also want to... Make sure that we use the uh, three Fs, uh, the find, uh, fix, and finish, uh, as well as fire and maneuver tactics in conjunction uh, with rifles. Uh, find means uh, that you find the assailant and engage him at least from behind cover and preferably at a distance at which he can effectively engage you. Again, that's that ballistic advantage concept that we talked about earlier. In doing this, you'll uh, draw his attention away from harming innocents and keeping with the priorities of life and direct it towards you and with luck, good positioning, and good shot placement, you just might end the fight right then and there. Uh, but if you don't, as more and more officers enter into the battle space, uh, we'll move from covered position to covered position. We'll then fix him in his position by cutting off his avenues of escape and limiting his ability to move without exposing himself to direct fire. While one officer is engaging the assailant with direct fire and occupying his attention, the other officers will continually maneuver to turn the assailant's flanks. We'll eventually put ourselves in positions where we can engage him with direct fire from behind multiple covered positions. Again, we can hit him and he can't hit us, both because of our uh, standoff advantage as well as the fact that uh, we're hopefully firing from behind cover. We'll put him in a position where he can no longer put cover between him and all the possible threat angles that we're presenting to him, and then we're going to finish the threat, the third F. And that means the assailant is reduced to just two choices, surrender or be shot, find, fix, and finish. 
We're usually going to have numerical superiority at a scene, and when we utilize the three Fs and combine the ballistic advantage with rifles of rifles with fire and maneuver tactics, we can't lose. And I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to one bullet point too fast, so uh, no, I'm caught up with where I need to be. Uh, the last thing to keep in mind is uh, we don't ever want to engage in a fair gunfight by choice. Uh, the only time you should, or the only time you would ever engage uh, in a gunfight that's either fair or when your disadvantage is when you were surprised and didn't enter in, into it by choice. We should fight as unfairly as we possibly can to reduce the threat as quickly as we possibly can. By utilizing the concepts of ballistic advantage, numerical superiority, and the tactic of fire and maneuver in an outdoor environment, we can assure that we'll win, we'll win quickly, and we'll win with the least possible risk to ourselves. The tactics that we use when responding to an indoor active assailant are very particular to the unique circumstances of indoor close quarters battle. We have a much greater advantage over the bad guys when operating outdoors, so don't give up that advantage by failing to realize the difference between those two environments and by employing close quarter tactics outdoors. Now let's talk about the concept of preparing the battlefield. Uh, in the Army, uh, again, uh, that's where this concept derives from. It was based on the idea that you always want to fight at the place and time of your choosing, and accordingly you prepare uh, that place of battle in advance to advantage yourself and disadvantage your enemy. Now, of course, in police work, the bad guy always gets to pick the battlefield, but that doesn't mean that we still can't prepare it in advance. So while we can't prepare every single place an assailant might choose to attack, we can prepare those that history teaches us have been desirable targets, our schools. So we should work with our uh, local schools to develop their crisis plans and alter their buildings to enhance our operations. And here's a number of things that we can do in that regard. Uh, number exterior doors sequentially, mark the exterior view of classroom windows with the classroom number, label hallways and stairwells, place you are here maps throughout the building, obtain access to school surveillance camera systems, and establish a communication system to let you know which classrooms contain wounded. All these things will greatly facilitate your ability to navigate through the building, isolate and contain the assailants, and quickly evacuate the wounded. Pre-plan how you will get into the building during a crisis. Most schools now remain locked during the day, which not only can keep the bad guys out, it keeps us out as well. Remember that in the Virginia Tech shooting, the assailant actually chained the doors from the inside. There are multiple solutions to this, but it must be planned and trained in advance of the crisis for all schools and other identified buildings. And a couple of ways you can uh, deal with those access issues is by providing access keys uh, to all of your officers or at least having a, a location at the building itself where they can uh, get those access keys. Another option is to have breaching equipment in every squad car and train your officers on how to use them. It's not enough just to throw them in the trunk of the car. Your officers have to know how they can be employed. Uh, and another thing you can do is uh, train your officers on how to use the squad car itself as a breaching tool. In the event the school district may be building a new school, remodeling, or adding an addition, make structural recommendations that will aid your operations while limiting an assailant. And some ideas there are putting exterior egress-only doors in each ground floor room, having two-way communication systems in each room uh, that allows for not only office to classroom, but also classroom to office, classroom to classroom, uh, communication, as well as the ability to communicate to the outside, namely us. The installation of security cameras with remote access by the police department. Uh, we have this in one of our high schools right now, and, and we're going to be uh, very shortly expanding it to all the other schools in our jurisdiction. Uh, what it does is it allows us from our telecom center to be able to remotely access and take control of uh, the entire security camera uh, apparatus from that school, which gives us a real-time uh, eye-in-the-sky view of what's going on in the school. And so far in our training exercises, that has been an absolutely invaluable tool for us. Another thing that uh, could be incorporated is remotely controllable, electronically locking doors, and remotely controllable barriers to seal off parts of the building. Um, they just passed a, a, a bond referendum in our last local elections here in April to allow the building of a new elementary school, and uh, I'll absolutely be reaching out to those school district officials to uh, make sure that they incorporate these ideas into that uh, new structure that they'll be building. We also want to help the schools develop their response plan and uh, make sure that you know what their response plan is going to be. Uh, we're the experts, and they're going to look to us for guidance in developing those response plans. So along those lines, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, 
the concepts of lockdown only, uh, which up until very recently was what, uh, as far as I know, just about every single school uh, in the country was practicing, versus newer concepts such as uh, Run, Hide, Fight, and Alice. First thing to keep in mind about Run, Hide, Fight is it's a great concept, but understand that it's an individual reaction, like stop, drop, and roll is an individual reaction for if you happen to catch on fire. It doesn't suffice for an organizational policy. If you asked a school principal what his fire policy was, and he said stop, drop, and roll, he'd probably be fired. Similarly, run, hide, fight can't be a school policy for responding to active assailant situations. Rather, run, hide, fight must be incorporated into a more comprehensive policy like Alice. And there's no reason why the two are contradictory. And you just have to understand that one is an individual response where the other is an organizational response. So getting back to the idea of lockdown, uh, no one thinks a good response to a school fire is to lock everyone in their classrooms and hope the fire department gets there before the fire does. But this is exactly what many schools use as their sole response for an active assailant in their building. So keep it simple. When there's someone in your building trying to kill people, the safest place to be is not in the building. A full school is a target-rich environment, and depopulating it to the extent possible makes all the sense in the world. Now, that's a concept that a, a lot of people uh, react negatively to uh, on a, a couple of different bases. Some think that self- or teacher-led evacuations prior to and during our arrival complicate our response. Uh, but again, liken it to a fire. Do we worry about that when responding to a fire? Uh, and do we really think that we won't be able to distinguish an assailant from a fleeing victim? When I'm entering a building with the expectation of engaging in a gunfight, I want as few innocents around as possible. Also, the fewer the number of people in the building, the quicker and easier the evacuation of the injured and the search and clear phases will be when we get to them. Some also think uh, that fleeing people will disappear forever. Uh, we therefore put our and the school's desire for control ahead of their lives, again, not in keeping with the priorities of life concept. Wherever they go once they get out of school, we'll eventually find them and be able to account for them. It doesn't need to be done immediately. Whatever perceived dangers they may face outside the school pales in comparison to what they were actually facing inside the school. Some also think that elementary school kids are too young for concepts like run, hide, fight. And uh, I would say that the Newtown experience argues against that. Uh, in that situation, of the two targeted classrooms, both were first grade, about as low as you can get on the K-12 spectrum as possible. Or as I've heard some people say, well, run, hide, fight is great maybe for college kids or, uh, or high school kids. Uh, but, you know, keep in mind, again, Newtown was first grade classrooms. If they could do it, anyone could do it. So discounting the two adults killed immediately after the assailant entered the building at Newtown, everyone else who died that day died in lockdown. The children who survived from one of the two targeted classrooms were the ones that either ran or hid. That says everything that needs to be said. As both their adult teacher and teacher's assistant had already been killed, they managed to run and hide without any adult leadership. So run, hide, fight builds on natural, inbred human reactions that we all have. It's instinctive and doesn't need to be taught, although obviously practice makes anything better. I'm not arguing against lockdown. I'm only saying that lockdown shouldn't be a school's only response. It needs to be a transitory step to another response when the situation allows, and that other response might not become a viable option for everyone in the building. Uh, but for those uh, who it does become a viable option for, they should be able to avail themselves of it. Lockdown initially de depopulates the target-rich environments in common areas, such as hallways, cafeterias, gyms, libraries, et cetera, and that's a good thing. Lockdown puts a barrier between you and the assailant, which can be a good immediate and temporary response, but it won't ensure long-term safety. Lockdown allows for more orderly planning for room-by-room -room evacuations by teachers and mitigates uh, against stampeding, which, again, are good things. Uh, keep in mind, though, that uh, evacuations where teachers must know in advance that they're empowered to make these evacuations decisions and not rely on direction from others to accomplish it. They also must be trained in advance in the decision-making process that would go into evacuation decisions. And lastly, they must have opportunities to practice it so they're comfortable uh, with it uh, during the execution phase. So as the principle behind the lockdown is to depopulate target-rich environments and put a barrier between the assailant and potential victims, let's take that principle one step further to its logical conclusion and now start to depopulate entire portions of the building and put an even greater barrier, the greatest barrier, between the assailant and potential victims, 
which is namely that they're no longer where he is. Another thing to keep in mind with run, hide, fight is it begs the question, fight with what? The answer to this question will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction depending on prevailing cultures, and I don't want to go into the various options here. Uh, but the ultimate answer is with everything else discussed here, it needs to be talked about, planned, and trained in advance of when it's needed. In outdoor settings, the physical spaces can't really be prepared in advance, but our response can. So again, make sure that the right weapons and ammunition are available, combined with the right tactics and the right command and control philosophy. Uh, that, those three things together can make your officers decisively effective immediately upon entering the battle space. So even though in outdoor situations we can't prepare the physical battlefield uh, prior to our response, we can prepare what our response is going to be. In both indoor and outdoor settings, know in advance how your fire department will respond. Plans for evacuating the wounded to casualty collection points, bringing paramedics into the warm zone, will they even enter into the warm zone, how security will be provided and by whom, all need to be worked out and clearly understood by both the police and fire departments in advance. Some agencies have learned the answers to these questions while victims are bleeding to death, and that's never a good thing. Make sure you don't let that happen to your agency. Agree and know in advance which agency, police or fire, will be in charge of the unified command structure. Arguing about it at the time it's actually happening is also never a good thing. Also know the conditions under which that command structure will change from one to another, and it will morph from one to another over time. It will likely start out with police. At some point in time, it may uh, morph uh, over to the fire department. Eventually, it's going to end up uh, with the people in charge of the building being in charge of it once the police and fire responses are no longer needed. Now let's talk about evacuating the wounded. First, we need to understand uh, the three-zone concept. We have the hot zone, which is the area in which the assailant is operating. Initially, the entire building is going to be the hot zone, but as officers increasingly occupy more and more territory within the building and increasingly tighten the noose on the assailant, the hot zone shrinks. Eventually, the hot zone is reduced to the small area in which the assailant is contained. Next, we have the warm zone. That's the area outside of the hot zone, which ha but which hasn't been cleared yet. The warm zone is critical to understand because that is where savable lives will either be saved or lost, and it's absolutely critical to pre-plan, communicate, and train with your fire department about how both of you will operate in this zone. And the last one is the cold, or uh, some places call it the cleared zone. Um, both mean the exact same thing, and that's the area that's been cleared. So these three zones uh, do not need to evolve sequentially. In fact, in all likelihood, they will exist simultaneously, at least at some point. Uh, as the assailant is isolated and contained in the hot zone, officers will clear uh, small cold zones in which to establish casualty collection points to which casualties are brought from the warm zone. Once all the casualties have been evacuated, search and clear operations are then conducted until the entire warm zone has been cleared and turned into the cold zone. Those casualty collection points can be safe zones inside the building or outside the building where we bring victims to, or alternatively, paramedics can follow us through the warm zone to treat victims where they lay, or all three may exist at the same time. This is completely up to local preference and the individual dynamics of the scene at hand and should be decided in conjunction with your fire department. The key is know in advance what your fire department will do. Will they enter the warm zone or will they only operate in cleared areas? The time to find out is not when critically injured people need immediate access to advanced life support. Now let's talk about the three types of casualties that you'll encounter. Uh, first is the dead, and the dead stay where they lay. While cops aren't legally empowered to pronounce death like paramedics are, we know it when we see it, and we'll be the only ones operating in the building at this time. Therefore, we'll need to make these decisions. To evacuate a dead body to a casualty collection point means that a live victim in critical need of ALS is going to die because we wouldn't make the call. We're going to have to distinguish the dead from the critically wounded and make sure that the critically wounded get evacu evacuated to advanced life support or advanced life support gets brought into them first. The dead don't get evacuated at all, and that includes, again, cops. They're part of the crime scene and remain where they are until the evidence scene work is completed. 
The second type is the seriously wounded who might die without quick access to advanced life support. These are the savable lives who will either live or die based on our decisions and actions. They are the first to go, and speed in their evacuation is absolutely critical. And the last type is the wounded who aren't going to die. Of course, bullets can do weird things upon hitting flesh and bone, and what looks like a non-life-threatening wound from the outside may in fact cause uh, life-threatening damage on the inside that we can't see. But we can't let the what-ifs distract us. If their wounds appear to be non-life-threatening, they get evacuated last. If ambulatory, they can self-evacuate to a casualty collection point with us as we carry the critically wounded, but otherwise they go last. Now let's talk about uh, conducting uh, that evacuation phase. And when I say evacuation, I'm talking about evacuation of the uh, wounded after uh, the assailant has been at least isolated and contained. So as officers move throughout the building in the effort to isolate and contain the assailant, they likely came across various indicators of the location of the wounded, the number of wounded, and the severity of their injuries. And this knowledge may have been gained uh, you know, several different ways, personal observation, uh, direct victim communication, uh, internal school communication systems like colored cards, uh, other reports from inside the school, statements of evacuees, cell phone calls or texts from those inside, inside the building, etc. While at that time we're not stopping to treat or evacuate any of the wounded, uh, for the reasons discussed above, the contact team should still be forwarding the locations, numbers, and types of wounded either to telecom or to a command post if you had already established one at that point. And the reason for that is when the time comes to begin evacuating the wounded, we'll already have an idea where some of them are, so no time is wasted in getting to them. If we wait to find them during search and clear operations, savable lives will be lost. It takes hours to clear a large building, and those in need of advanced life support don't have that long. With all known assailants at least isolated and contained, if not eliminated, it's also time now to start planning the establishment of your casualty collection points uh, and the evacuation and transportation of the wounded to advanced life support. Accordingly, it's also now time to start establishing your unified command structure uh, for the, various, uh, the following uh, various reasons. Coordination with the fire department regarding unified command, location and staffing of the casualty collection points, whether or not medics will be taken into the warm zone to treat injuries, transportation of wounded to the hospitals will require that uh, incident command structure to be in place. While the evacuation of the wounded is still the top priority, uh, family members, the media, and the just plain curious will start to arrive at the scene, requiring perimeters to be quickly established. If you don't do that, family members will run right into your scene. Uh, the planning of collection points for evacuated non-wounded persons and a process and location for family reunification also needs to begin at this stage and staging areas for arriving mutual aid resources that you uh, put a call out for way at the beginning of the incident uh, will start to arrive and will also need to be planned. Uh, also planning for arriving media and briefing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, arriving media and media briefings also needs to begin. So in evacuating the wounded, we should again work in two officer teams. Just as in the search for the assailant, time is still critical in evacuating the critically wounded to advanced life support and two officer teams can evacuate twice as many victims twice as fast compared to the traditional four officer evacuation teams that most of us were trained in. When both members of a two officer team are engaged in carrying a victim, some would argue that it's unsafe because no one is providing cover. But just as with the initial search for the assailant, we must keep in alignment with the priorities of life. How do we justify leaving injured victims to die because we're more concerned with our own safety? And we also must keep in mind what history teaches us about the assailant. We've traditionally been trained to think that there are always potentially more assailants out there until we can pronounce the entire building cleared. But again, in reality, there was probably only one. If there was more than one, there were only two, and they likely remained together. When one or the pair are isolated and contained and possibly eliminated, there is almost certain to be no one else. The key here is the term known assailant. If we know there is still an assailant at large, then no evacuations of the wounded should begin until he is at least isolated and contained. But when there is no other threat known to us, we are foolish if we let the what-ifs overcome the what-is. What is happening is people are bleeding to death, and we need to get them to ALS to save their lives. If we delay in accomplishing this by being bogged down by thinking, what if there's another boogeyman out there, we will add to the death toll. The known has to supersede the unknown. If we adhere to the principle of evacuating no wounded until all known assailants are at least isolated and contained, then there should be no expectation of encountering any more assailants in the warm zone. 
Of course, there's always still that possibility, which is why we clear areas for the casualty collection points and post security at them, but no expectation. So why then would we tie up four officers per team for the critical task of evacuating the critically wounded who are in danger of dying when two of the four team members exist only to protect against a threat that by definition we don't really expect to be there? Is this in keeping with the priorities of life? If by chance another previously unknown assailant was encountered during evacuations of the wounded, the two team members simply drop their victim, rearm themselves, and engage the assailant, which is exactly what they were trained to do when operating as part of a four-officer team uh, evacuation team anyways. So nothing is lost in using two-officer evacuation teams except possibly the couple of seconds it would take to drop your victim and draw your weapon rather than having it at the ready, but much is gained. So now let's talk about the actual clearing of the building. We've already uh, had our uh, known assailants isolated and contained, if not eliminated, uh, and we've also evacuated uh, the wounded now. Now it's time to start clearing the building. So just as no wounded are evacuated until all known assailants are at a minimum isolated and contained, so also clearing operations will not begin until all known uh, living victims have been evacuated to advanced life support with the exception of clearing the casualty collection points so the wounded can be brought to ALS. Up until clearing operations begin, uh, speed is critical. This is why, according to our life priorities, we put our lives at greater risk in order to save innocent lives. But once all known assailants are at a minimum isolated and contained and all known living victims have been evacuated to ALS, there is no longer a higher life priority than ours. Accordingly, we now do everything slowly and methodically, ensuring maximum safety for the officers involved. If the assailant is still isolated and contained, it's treated as a conventional barricade situation, and the elimination phase is done as safely and methodically as possible, preferably by SWAT. As the entire building is searched and cleared, we now revert to the traditional four to five officer team so as to provide heightened security and the manpower needed for room to room clearing. There's still no reason to expect contact with any more assailants, but as there are also no more victims in danger, uh, time is no longer critical. Now is the time to worry about us and complete the remaining task as safely as possible, however long that takes. This is NIMS time to shine. It's during the clearing operation when outside assistance will likely arrive and will need to be coordinated. The rotation of personnel may be necessary. Logistics will need to be managed. Inner and outer perimeters will need to be fully established and controlled. Media areas will become heavily populated. Press conferences will be conducted regularly. Family reunification plans will continue. Costs will need to be documented. And the eventual turning over of the scene to others, such as evidence technicians, the coroner, and ultimately building officials will need to be planned. This is when NIMS and the Unified Command slash Incident Command structure will be at peak effectiveness and will be absolutely crucial to a well-managed incident. Up until this point, the necessity for speed required uh, pre-planned actions to be executed, immediate action drills. But now during the search and clear phase it is the time to slow down, communicate, fully exert command and control, and plan. And now let's talk about the after action review. Uh, an after-action review is a standard part of any large-scale action, such as an act of assailant response. It's a useful and necessary exercise and provides a good conclusion to the incident, and it should include all of the parties involved in the action. But let's face it, the main purpose of an after-action review is to talk about what went wrong, why it went wrong, and how it can be improved the next time. But as most agencies will never go through something like this once, it's, it's extremely unlikely that lightning will strike twice and you'll go through it again. So instead of waiting for a tragic incident to finish before talking about how to do it better the next time that will likely never come, put at least as much effort into pre-action planning as you would into an after-action review. Involve all the same parties that you'd want to participate in an after-action review, your fire department, your local school officials, parent organizations, mutual aid partners, your local hospitals, your coroner, your local media, officials from sites that would serve as uh, reunification centers, and anyone else who would likely play a role in an active assailant response in your jurisdiction. Discuss in detail the various roles everyone will play in the expectations of and from each. Make or adjust plans on the basis of these discussions. Engage in large-scale training involving as many of these stakeholders as possible and revise plans as necessary based on the training outcomes. 
Make sure that the training is as realistic as possible. Train regularly as when people move within or leave organizations, organizational knowledge is lost, and what you once thought was worked out and understood may no longer be. While planning and tabletop exercises may be good initial steps in developing your pre-action planning, they can never replace on-the-ground training. Good pre-action planning will make your incident run as smoothly as possible and will hopefully lead to the after-action review. Uh, hopefully you'll never have one, but if you do, it'll lead to the after-action review being a discussion of what went right rather than what went wrong. So I know a lot of the material presented here runs contrary to what has been accepted and taught as best practices for many years, although it appears that recent trends are starting to move in, direction, in the direction of these concepts. Uh, some will accept it, some will reject it, and it will certainly spark a lot of thought and discussion. Uh, so this presentation went on long enough, and I thank you all for your attention. Uh, I wasn't able to go into uh, detailed explanations for a lot of the points I made due to time constraints, so if anyone wishes to contact me for any further discussion or explanation of the things presented uh, in this webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. My contact information is uh, up on the screen now if you'd like to contact me either by uh, phone or email. Again, please feel free to do so. And that is all I have. Great. Thank you so much, Commander Nelson. Um, this has certainly been a very educational session. Um, we do have time for just a couple of quick questions from the audience. And I just want to let you know that, like Commander Nelson said, if for some reason we don't address your question today, please feel free to reach out to him. His contact information is on the screen, and you can have an offline uh, conversation with them. So with that said, um, you. The first question we have is, you made some excellent points about adding schools and, develop, and, and aiding schools and developing their response plans and reviewing it with them. How often would you recommend an agency or jurisdiction work with their schools? Is this something that should be done on an annual basis whenever there's a new um, cohort of students, or is this done every semester? I mean, obviously, resources are scarce. So what are your kind of recommendations there? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the answer to it is largely going to be driven by local circumstances. For instance, Illinois just passed a law within the last year or two uh, that requires schools uh, to go over uh, you know, these plans uh, once a year uh, with their local police departments and, and to actually practice them, not just review the plans, but to practice them. Um, so obviously there may be a, a controlling law or ordinance like that that you'd have to uh, abide by. Um, other than that, um, yeah, I, I think it's absolutely critical uh, that you meet with every single school in your jurisdiction in order to uh, develop those plans. Once those plans are developed, uh, I think it's obviously important to uh, have a communication channel established between the two of you so that uh, any changing circumstances are communicated uh, you know, between both. We have a, a form that we would send out uh, via email uh, every year in the month prior to the beginning of a new school year so that the schools had an opportunity to uh, inform us of any uh, changes in their response plans or uh, any contact information, whether it be the names of officials or phone numbers uh, for the, the people uh, in the schools that would be involved in, uh, in a crisis response. Uh, we also set it up so that they don't have to wait for the beginning of the next school year uh, to send us any of that changed information. Uh, anytime any of that information changes, they would merely pull up the saved document uh, make the change, and then electronically uh, email the document back to us. So if those changes happen at any point during the school year, we would be immediately advised of it. Um, but I think uh, meeting, uh, at, at, you, you want to make sure you, you meet with everyone in your school at least once to discuss these plans. And I think uh, my own personal opinion is uh, a once-a-year follow-up uh, just to discuss and review the plans and make sure nothing has changed is probably a good idea. Yeah, definitely some excellent points. You know, along those lines, when you're training with the schools and you're developing their plans and you're reviewing it with them, is this something that you engage, especially when you're dealing with elementary schools or even high schools with juveniles, is this something where the parents are also engaged or is it usually just limited to the folks in the school? The last time we did this training, which was last summer with uh, one of our uh, major public high schools, uh, the initial plan was that the parents were going to be involved in the training as well. And part of the reason for that was um, they, they tend to want to rush to the scene and, and, and in one case even try and get into the scene when they think their kids are in danger. Uh, when, when they think their kids' lives are on the lines, uh, like all other thought process, processes, 
uh, seem to evaporate, and all they want to do is, uh, you know, uh, get there, get in, and uh, do something uh, to try and, uh, you know, help their children, although they have no idea what that uh, something is going to be. What we were hoping was that by involving the parents in the training, and once they realized, uh, you know, what the plan actually was, A, that there was a plan, and B, that there was a good plan, uh, they're much more likely uh, to be confident enough in our response uh, to sit on the sidelines and let, let us handle the situation rather than try and uh, rush in and make things worse. Um, that ended up falling through uh, because on the, on the school end they weren't able to make the coordination with the parent groups. So even though we didn't do it, uh, I think the concept is still a good one. And uh, to the extent that you can involve your parents in some of this uh, planning, I would. One thing I'd like to point out, though, is um, don't get into too much details uh, with the parents, and for that matter, even with the students. One thing I didn't talk about in the presentation is, again, we have to go with what history teaches us. And history teaches us that uh, your assailant is uh, more often than not a student. So when you practice these things uh, with uh, students uh, or with parents, you let your response uh, be known out in the public, and all that does is allow future assailants, and again, the mass murderers put extensive planning and preparation uh, you know, into their plan. Um, it, it allows them to know what you're going to do and then attempt to counter it. The example I use is uh, if you and I are both um, you know, coaches of a, of a team, let's say a, a foot, football team that are getting ready to play, and I happen to come across uh, your offensive playbook uh, prior to the game, uh, if I'm, uh, you know, somebody that's not virtuous, uh, would that affect uh, my defensive game plan? Of course it would. If I know how you're going to attack me, uh, I'm going to change uh, what my defense is going to be. We've spent about 15 years now uh, telling uh, the greatest uh, you know, potential assailant pool exactly what our plan is going to be to the point where uh, every single student now knows what the lockdown is. And if you've paid attention uh, during the more recent events, it seems that uh, the assailants are adjusting their plan accordingly. Um, the old concept was based on depopulating the common areas and keeping uh, the assailant circulating in empty hallways, uh, you know, looking for victims in the places where he would expect to find large con concentrations of them, hallways, gyms, cafeterias, libraries, et cetera, when in reality uh, they were all hiding, uh, you know, in classrooms, behind locked doors, being, uh, you know, made to look like there was nobody there. Except the problem was uh, we, we trained our students in that response, and uh, we let that response uh, get out into the public so that now uh, any potential assailant, whether it's a student or somebody else, knows that uh, those rooms aren't empty, those rooms are in fact occupied, and all you have to do is get into one of them, and you'll likely encounter enough people to get the record. Um, so be careful when you, uh, when you do any of this uh, planning and training with parents and students and keep in mind that we, uh, we want to give them enough information to make them feel comfortable uh, that our response is going to be appropriate so that they don't uh, make things worse by trying to intervene without giving them uh, too much of a tip-off uh, to the point that if one of them should someday become the assailant, uh, they're not going to know too much about what our game plan is and be able to uh, come up with a, an effective uh, counter-response to it. Yeah, you definitely made some excellent points there. I mean, way too many excellent points to even list. But the notion of the assailants becoming more sophisticated and learning from one another and learning from previous incidents is certainly true, and the research shows that. Um, with that, I realize that we're over time today. If anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to Commander Nelson. Um, I, he certainly has a wealth of information. Um, Commander Nelson, with that, this actually concludes our session. Do you have any final comments or closing remarks you'd like to share with today's audience? Uh, no, I don't. And uh, again, thank you all very much for your attention and for uh, uh, tuning into the webinar. And again, uh, please feel free to contact me with any uh, follow-up questions uh, that you have or, or discussion that you would like to have. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your time today. Um, everybody, stay safe. Have a great day. And um, until next time. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.